Hi, I'm Agent Ford. Do you think you can help me solve another true crime mystery? John Edward Robinson is a serial killer, embezzler, kidnapper, and forger who murdered at least eight women between 1984 and 2000. Still, from the outside, he was the ideal family man. He was the coach for his four children's sports teams. He was a Sunday school teacher, and he volunteered. He looked like a mild-mannered, grandfatherly guy. No one could have ever guessed. He was a master manipulator, one who was an expert at seeking out vulnerable women, luring them into his orbit, and ultimately, cold-heartedly, killing them. In 2003, he was found guilty of three murders, and two years later, he confessed five additional homicides. Almost 80 years old, he's on death row. But while he's known to be responsible for eight homicides, investigators fear that there may be other victims yet to discover. John Edward Robinson was born on December 27, 1943, in Cicero, Illinois. Third of five children of an alcoholic father and a disciplinarian mother, his childhood was definitely not a picnic. In 1964, he moved to Kansas City and married Nancy Jo Lynch, with whom he had four children, John Jr., Kimberly, and twins Christopher and Christine. His troubles with the law started in 1969 when he was arrested after embezzling $33,000 from the medical practice where he worked as an x-ray technician. He was sentenced to three years of probation. He was arrested again for stealing firm funds and check forgery in 1971 and 1975 and again in 1980. Despite everything, during this period, he cultivated and maintained the outward appearance of a community-minded citizen and impeccable family man. He coached his children's sports teams, was a Sunday school teacher. He volunteered. He looked like he could be, you know, the clerk at the drugstore, said everyone who knew him. Sure, he had his problems with the law, but he paid for his mistakes. Now he was just trying his best to help his community, or so everyone thought. No one knew he was still stealing money by starting fraudulent shell companies. Better off, no one knew something dark was growing inside him. Something far worse than embezzling. Things with Robinson started degenerating during the 80s. Simultaneously, a brand new world became more accessible. The internet. As a matter of fact, since he made contact with some of his victims via online chat rooms, he is known as the internet's first serial killer. In the early 80s, Robinson joined a secret sadomasochism cult called the International Council of Masters. He stated that he became its slave master. His duties included luring victims to gatherings for the cult members to torture and rape them. In the same period, he reportedly began sexually propositioning his neighbors' wives. After starting two more fraudulent shell companies, Robinson hired Paula Godfrey, a 19-year-old who was supposed to work as his sales representative. It was 1984, and that's when his monster instinct kicked off. Paula's parents filed a missing person report after not hearing from her for days. She had told them she wasn't working for Robinson anymore, and that was the last time they had ever heard from their daughter. Police interviewed John Robinson as he was one of the last people to meet Paula, but he denied knowing her whereabouts. A couple of days after, Paula's parents received a letter from their daughter in which she thanked Robinson for helping her and giving her a job. She concluded she was okay, but did not want to see her family for a while. Looking back, that was clearly a forged letter, but at the time, it put an end to the investigations. Paula Godfrey was of legal age, and there was no evidence of wrongdoing. Still, no trace of the girl has ever been found. A year later, Robinson met Lisa Stasi and her four-month-old daughter, Tiffany. Lisa lived at a woman's shelter, and Robinson promised to help her. She would have had a secure job, an apartment, and daycare for her baby. All she had to do was move to Chicago. Lisa, scared and defenseless, agreed and signed several sheets of black stationery, just as Robinson asked her to. Only a couple of days later, Robinson contacted his brother Don, who had been in the system for adopting a baby for ages, and told him he knew of a toddler whose mother had just committed suicide. In a matter of days, Don Robinson and his wife Helen received their baby girl and a set of authentic-looking adoption papers with lawyers and judges' forged signatures. As a DNA test confirmed in 2000, that baby was Tiffany Stasi. On the other hand, Lisa was never heard from again after moving to Chicago, thanks to Robinson's unnatural act of kindness. In 1987, yet another vulnerable girl left her family for the chance of a better life. Catherine Clampett. She moved to Kansas City to find employment. 
Instead, she found John Robinson. He hired her to work in one of his shell companies, and in a couple of weeks, she vanished. She was never found. From 1987 to 1993, Robinson was incarcerated on multiple fraud convictions and parole violations. In prison, he met yet another woman, 49-year-old Beverly Bonner, the prison librarian. When Robinson was released, Bonner left her husband and moved with him to Kansas City. Once again, after arranging Bonner's alimony checks to be forwarded to a Kansas post office box, her family never heard from her again. By that time, John Robinson had discovered the new and incredibly open world of the internet, where he roamed various BDSM social networking sites and online chat rooms. Using his old name, Slave Master, Robinson started searching for women who enjoyed playing this submissive role. Women like Sheila Faith. Faith was a vulnerable woman with a sick daughter named Debbie, and Robinson offered to help them by paying Debbie's medical expenses and giving Sheila a job. As Godfrey, Stassi, Clampett, and Bonner did before her, Sheila Faith trusted Robinson and moved to Kansas City in 1994. Sadly, just like the previous women, both Sheila and Debbie disappeared shortly after arriving at Robinson's, while he kept cashing their pension for the next seven years. Through his BDSM online chat rooms, he was becoming more and more popular. In 1999, Robinson met Isabella Lewicka, a 21-year-old Polish immigrant to whom he offered a job and a bondage relationship. She signed a 115-item slave contract, giving Robinson almost total control over every aspect of her life, including her bank account, and moved to Kansas City. Around that same time, another girl moved to Robinson's to be his submissive sex slave, Suzette Troughton. Shortly after moving there, they both disappeared. So, what happened to these girls? Why would they disappear in the dark after believing John Edward Robinson? What was going on inside his mind? One thing was for sure. Robinson had a pattern. He'd meet vulnerable and hopeless women and offer them his help. Manipulated by Robinson, they'd all leave their lives to follow him, only to vanish and have their money stolen by him. By that time, John Robinson attracted authorities' attention as his name popped up in more and more missing persons investigations. Despite this, presumptuous John Robinson was becoming careless and was doing a more poor job of covering his tracks. He didn't know yet, but his whole house of cards was about to come tumbling down on him. John Edward Robinson was arrested on June 2, 2000, while on his farm near Lysen, Kansas. A woman had filed a sexual battery complaint against him while another had accused him of stealing her sex toys. So the police went to his house to arrest him and that's when it all hit the fan. A task force found two decaying bodies on his property, later identified as Isabella Lewicka and Suzette Troughton, in two chemical drums. Searching a storage facility across the state line in Missouri, Robinson had rented. Other task force members found three similar chemical drums containing the corpses of Beverly Bonner, Sheila Faith and her daughter, Debbie Faith. All five women were killed by one or two blows to their head with a blunt instrument. In 2002, in Kansas, John Edward Robinson stood trial for the murders of Troughton, Lewicka, and Stasi, and with multiple lesser charges. He was convicted on all counts and received the death sentence for the murders. He also received a 5-20 to 20 year prison sentence for interfering with the parental custody of Tiffany Stasi, 20 years for kidnapping Troughton, and seven months for theft. After Robinson faced additional murder charges in Missouri, Missouri prosecutor Chris Coster insisted as a condition of any plea bargain that Robinson lead authorities to Stasi, Godfrey, and Clampett's bodies, but Robinson refused. Coster's problem was that his case was not technically airtight since there was no unequivocal evidence that any of the murders had actually been committed within his jurisdiction. When it became clear that the woman's remains would never be found without Robinson's cooperation, the two parts reached a compromise of sorts. In a carefully scripted plea, Robinson acknowledged that Coster had enough evidence to convict him of capital murder for the deaths of Godfrey, Clampett, Bonner, and the Faiths. It took the jury less than a day to deliver a guilty verdict and, in the end, John Edward Robinson received a life sentence without the possibility of parole for each of the five murders. Today, John Edward Robinson is a man in his 80s waiting to die. As one of the investigators who worked on his case said, he's maintained the secrets about what he's done with the women and he won't ever tell. It's the last control that he's got. He killed eight women for their money, but his total victim tally is 
still unknown. There are probably other barrels waiting to be opened, other bodies waiting to be found, stated another officer. Experts are still asking themselves what went wrong and why Robinson decided embezzling wasn't enough anymore after reaching a certain point. Between 2001 and 2004, four books were written about him, documenting his crimes and analyzing the possible connection between his BDSM kink and his serial killer nature. Anyway, being the slave master he brags he is, John Edward Robinson simply won't tell what happened, nor if he had committed any more murders. He's just too good at manipulating people. He enjoys it too much. And now that he's behind bars, that piece of information is the very last thing he has control over. He will probably hold on to it, to his dying day. Let me know what you guys think about this case in the comments below, as I always look forward to reading your theories. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to hit that like button and share it with your fellow investigators. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Hit that notification bell so you never miss a case. With that being said, stay safe, and I'll see you guys at the next crime scene.